Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another edition of your favorite wrestling podcast. It is Ring Respect Radio right here on the Video Bros Network. I am Bobby Munson, and I'm joined by my video bro. He is the man with the angelic voice, the throat of the goat. You know him as Papa Smokes. How you doing, Pop Smokes? I'm good. How you doing, Munson? And how are all you wrestling people doing out there? Hopefully everybody's doing great, staying safe, having a good old time out there in wrestling land, watching lots of wrestling because there's a lot to choose from, Papa Smokes. And we're going to get down to that right away here, talking about MLW Fusion 121 doing our recap and review on this episode of Ring Respect Radio. Uh, we got a couple of mentions that we got to do here at the beginning as well, too. But we also got a big interview up today. We got our good friend Spencer Love of Love Wrestling going to be joining us later on the program. Uh, excited to talk to ben Spencer here tonight, Papa Smokes. Yeah, very much. I've admired his work uh, online and such. I'd be glad to talk to the man uh, over uh, Zoom. It's going to be a great time. Looking forward to that. That's coming up later in the episode. Uh, but before that, and before we get really rolling with the episode here today, I want to ask you all to go ahead, click the subscribe button down below, give us a good old thumbs up, and turn on those notifications. That way you help us out, and also you'll know anytime we release new material right here on the Video Bros Network. Uh, while you're at it, also go and check out our good friends at Backbreaker Media. Speaking of our friends in Alberta, Backbreaker Media, also a great sponsor of us here at Ring Respect Radio. They put our show out on their YouTube channel on Podbean. You know what? You can find us all over the damn place now, Papa Smokes. We're, we're, we're everywhere these days. It's great to see. Yeah, it's great that we've branched out online here. We've got Ring Respect Radio now uh, available on a number of different platforms. We hope to get some more listeners and uh, have some more fun. Yeah, so thank you to all our friends in Alberta. And big thanks to Mike. Mike, you are the man. You've helped us out a ton. Appreciate everything you do and look forward to all the work we get to do with you in the future as well too, brother. Uh, but from there, Pop Smokes, uh, before we get to our MLW Fusion 121 recap and review, couple of uh, sad mentions that we got to mention on the show today. A couple of passings in the wrestling world that we should uh, talk about. Uh, we've lost a big name in uh, Jim Crockett Jr. That, that one uh, kind of came out of nowhere. Yeah, yeah. I had heard that he wasn't well for a short time before uh, he actually passed. But uh, a huge loss in the wrestling world and the historic, uh, historical version of the history of uh, of wrestling, pardon me, I'm, I'm screwing up my words here, but uh, Jim Crockett Jr., uh, the, obviously the son of Jim Crockett Sr., who had been promoting in Charlotte, North Carolina since 1935, started Jim Crockett promotions in the Carolinas and Virginia and uh, helped form the main NWA governing body in 1948. And as we know now, Jim Crockett promotions, one of the most successful uh, promotional uh uh, companies in professional wrestling history. Uh, Jim Jr. took it over in 1973 and was also uh, elected to head of the NWA governing board during the 80s. And uh, I mean, there's just no two ways about it. Jim Crockett Jr. Uh, was the, the second biggest promoter in, in American wrestling history next to, of course, Vince McMahon. But uh, we all know about the Monday Night War, Wars in which they battled for ratings and uh, supremacy uh, of their respective TV shows. And uh, Crockett will never be forgotten for the, the business he's done in wrestling all throughout the South and all throughout uh, the United States. Yeah, definitely a lot of legendary status there from Crockett Promotions. And we could go into full detail. And you know what? I think we almost should sometime... Uh, go into a little bit more detail on Crockett family, the promotions, everything that they did for the wrestling industry. Uh, further down the line, I think that would make a great episode of Ring Respect, and I think we should definitely cover it. And our condolences to the friends and family of Jim Crockett Jr. Yeah, that's a fine idea, too. And we could also uh, do a little specialty uh, deep dive on the Jim Crockett promotions uh, Crockett Cup Tag Team Tournament, that, that would be a good time. I, st I think that we should add all that together and make one great episode of Ring Respect for the fans there, Pop Smokes. But uh, Jim Crockett Jr., not the only passing that we had just recently. Uh, you know, both of us, big fans of the NWA, National Wrestling Alliance, and Josephus, or, you know, the question mark as he was starting to be known, uh, working with Aaron Stevens there towards... Uh, the latter part of the NWA uh, power run and those episodes prior to the uh, COVID shutdown, 
out of nowhere, this guy passes away. And I believe he was just 40 years old, if I'm not mistaken, or just barely into his yeah. 40s. This is sad, Papa Smokes. Yeah, yeah, sad for me too. Uh, like we were just saying, we we, we have been reviewing uh, the Billy Corgan era at NWA since they've uh, started up over the past year or two. And uh, Josephus was going to be, looked primed to be one of the main uh one of the main wrestlers on that and then it never really took off with him and I, I never understood what happened he always seemed to be waiting in the sidelines but uh under josephus he never really got his big break and then uh and then yeah as we saw he uh he took the mantle of the question mark which uh which they had as a as a developmental talent with aaron stevens kind of thing and uh you know, as wrestling fans are, are kind of unpredictable in who they side with, they, they ended up uh, taking up for the underdog in the question mark, and uh, he got over in a big way, and uh, and yeah, it's, it's left a hole in the hearts of NWA fans that uh, Joseph is gone at age 40. We still don't really know how either, but it seems like he was a private man, so uh, I'm not going to look into it too much. I'm just going to... Uh, more in his passing yeah the only things i've really heard and not anything negative about the guy i've heard that he left behind a wife and kids that's very sad to hear about that again not him leaving them behind this is a very unfortunate uh, situation with his passing and everything like that uh, and my uh, our condolences to his family uh, all his friends everybody over in the nwa as well too uh, but i've also heard a lot about how just a great guy he was he was the guy he was always there he was helpful, friendly, really helped everybody out, and he was there to, you know, to do what he was asked of and to do his job, which is more than you can ever ask for out of a person backstage in a wrestling company. I mean, this guy was primed to be something special, I believe, in the NWA. There was something there the fans were clicking with, and it's very unfortunate we're not going to get to see that pan out the way it should have. Yeah, yeah, very sad passing, and, uh, and uh, we'll miss him, but... Uh, we NWA and wrestling will have to go on. It sure will. And hey, you know what? Speaking of, I mean, we'd be wrong to not mention it. A big announcement. The NWA is going to be returning NWA power and also with an NWA pay-per-view. Uh, going to be available through Fight TV by the sounds of it, Papa Smokes, though. It doesn't sound like this will be the NWA power we were used to from uh, the YouTube weekly programming. They're actually going to be featured on Fight TV instead moving forward. Uh, great news, at least. The NWA returning to that wrestling action. Yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah, having to change platforms a little bit, I, I can't blame them. Like we've said in the past, uh, do what you got to do, guys, to keep running. And uh, if that means uh, now putting your stuff uh, on a pay site and all that, just just do it and, and keep your product running. That, that's all I'm worried about during these COVID times. Well, I'll tell you what, putting it on Fight TV has made me think about uh, starting to stream Fight TV coming up once NWA comes out because I like it that much, Papa Smokes. I might have to make the investment into some Fight TV. Yeah, it might be a good idea. I think there's a lot of good stuff on there. Yeah, looking forward to it. But, hey, you know what? Speaking of looking forward to and shows that you can catch on YouTube, how about MLW Fusion? That's Major League Wrestling. We've been doing these recap reviews getting a lot of interaction with the actual workers over at mlw which is fantastic i know we've been retweeted we've been commented we've been seen by mlw uh fans and also with the wrestlers as well too man it's this is an exciting time here on ring respect papa smokes yeah isn't it hey, i know you've had some interactions on social media with uh, mlw and its workers so have i it's fun and it, it's uh, it's like a tiny little pat on the back. At, at least somebody uh, notices that we uh, are are fans of their work. We're uh, uh, trying to kick in and, and help them uh, spread the word about their work, and it's nice to know they realize that and appreciate that too. Yeah, and even our last episode of the uh, Ring Respect Radio was even uh, tweeted out by uh, he. Uh, sorry, I bad with pronunciations again. Bob's the most, but. Hio De La Park, if I'm not mistaken, one half of the tag team champions, Los Park. He tweeted out the last episode of Ring Respect Radio. So right there, hey, we're starting to be seen by the right people. It's fantastic. Put a big old smile on this guy's face. That's great. That's great. Uh, I've had some interactions with uh, Ross and Marshall Von Eric too. And uh, yeah, just good that 
while we're trying to get their name out there, they're helping us get ours out there too. Yeah, great people over there. So do them, do them a big solid. Head on over to YouTube. Check out MLW Fusion on YouTube. Uh, hit the subscribe button over on their channel as well. And, you know, keep up to date with what they got going on. Uh, if you don't want to check them out on YouTube, though, you can also check them out on many other different uh, platforms, Fubo TV, the DAZN app. There's, uh, I believe, even the Roku channel has picked up some of the MLW Fusion as well, too. Court Bauer really getting the name out there for MLW. It's great news as a wrestling fan, especially if you enjoy this company, which we do. And speaking of, MLW Fusion 121, let's get our thoughts on this one, Papa Smokes. Uh, why don't you kick us off with uh, how MLW 121 took off? All right. Well, this episode started right into some uh, wrestling action in the ring. So we had ACH versus Brian Pillman Jr. ACH still with those uh, ribs taped up from the uh, attack by Team Filthy a few weeks ago. So he's going to have to fight through that against a very game opponent in Brian Pillman Jr. What did you think of this match? I did enjoy this one. And, you know, we've seen Brian Pillman Jr. in this spot a lot of the times, you know, there is a guy to really uh, get a lot of these bigger names like ACH over and stuff like that while still giving them a good solid bit of competition, not being just a, you know, a form of a development, you know, wrestler in that ring. I mean, he's a, he's a good mid Carter. He gives you a good solid uh, bit of work. I actually think that this was some of the better work I've seen from Brian Pillman Jr. Since we started doing these reviews, I think he's picking up a lot and starting to get in there. And he had a good chemistry with ACH, which I like to see in this one. Yeah, yeah, fully agree with that. Um, we have seen Pillman look a little lackluster in, in some of his uh, matches that he's had since uh, since MLW restarted. But I think we have to remember, too, that, that Pillman's also working for AEW now, and he's uh, he's got a full schedule there, uh, however full that schedule is. He probably only has to wrestle once a week or so, but... It's nice that he's still doing shots for MLW. I also think that benefits Pillman a lot, just as any wrestler, to have more matches all the time, more matches each week, more matches each month. There's no way you can't uh, get better uh, in wrestling all kinds of different competition um, in a short time throughout uh, throughout different uh, federations and such. So uh, Pillman doing himself a favor in working lots here, and it's showing in his ring work. Yes, definitely so. And, I mean, ACH is just, he's fantastic. Love that guy's work, and he picked up a great win here. All the while, continuing the story with Team Filthy. Team Filthy coming out, sitting on the rampway, watching as ACH took on Brian Pillman Jr. We had to know shenanigans were going to go down at the end of this one. Yeah, yeah, and, and ACH, no sooner had he picked up the win in this match he, with a high kick followed by a brain buster, but yeah, Team Filthy entering the ring, putting the beat down on ACH until the save comes in the form of the Von Ericks who come running in, and a uh, full-out brawl ensues. So here we have more heat built up between Team Filthy and the Von Ericks as well. This is going to get wild at some point. Uh, we saw... Tom Lawler uh, with the Von Erics as, as a, you know as a friend and a co-trainer kind of thing with the Von Eric boys last year, but uh, that that fell apart. He stabbed them in the back. So this feud rages on, and uh, and this uh, match with ACH here will just uh, only further that feud. And I absolutely love the continuity that MLW are providing as well, too. I mean, here you've got this setup, now a program building with Team Filthy. Like you said, it, it dates back a long time, the uh, animosity with the Von Erics and with, uh, sorry, uh, with the Von Erics and with Tom Waller. Now that Tom Waller's got his boys there, Team Filthy, all together, and he screwed the Von Erics essentially out of their MLW tag team titles, it would seem they're going into this program and... In the meanwhile, ACH gets brought in, and it's not illogical that he gets brought in because he's from Texas, just like the Von Erich family and everything like that. So there's that, uh, you know, that get you know co that continuity that they built. It's also you know great to see the, the alliance being built with ACH and the Von Erichs due to you know coming from the same state and everything like that, and wanting to be able to fight for what they feel is right and taking on Team Filthy and uh, getting justice for the wrongdoing that Tom Waller caused them. Yeah, yeah, and, and when you watch other wrestling products these days, you see uh, 
a lot of booking that, that doesn't have that continuity that is that is lazy that just thinks that the fans will not remember what happened before or not care but I, I think they do care or, or the fans that are really watching closely do care and yeah like you say this continuity that goes back you know a full calendar year to what was happening last year it still makes sense in in the logic of the presentation so i mean this is just great booking we've always praised uh, bauer and uh, whoever he has uh, making his matches for him too and uh, just another job well done uh, all this stuff always makes sense and, and if it doesn't make sense they don't do it so uh, tip of the hat to MLW for always having that logical booking. And again, also that they didn't have to immediately have the Von Ericks get their rematch for the tag team titles. They've gone into a completely different program, separating those two teams for now. Again, the Von Ericks going to work their way back to that tag team title matchup that they, you know, obviously deserve after the way they were cheated out of their tag team titles as well. But, you know, it's it's just fantastic, the build here and everything, and not having to give these matches away the very following week and just right away, you know, burning all your all your possible, you know, match possibilities so quickly like many of the big companies do these days. Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely right. And uh, just taking it at a nice, steady pace, um, not hot-shotting your booking, not giving everything all at once, but just slow and steady, and make sure everyone's along, make sure everyone understands. And uh, I just think the matches and the show are put together quite cleverly. Yeah, I've been enjoying it more and more each week. It's fantastic. Love this, love this booking. This was all really well done. Great for all all parties involved, including Brian Pillman Jr., who ended up looking pretty decent at the end of this, despite his, uh, his loss. I think he's coming along nicely. And, you know, a couple of years from now, we might be seeing a whole different Brian Pillman Jr., yeah, yeah, I think so, too. Oh, from there. So I believe the next up on the show, Pop and Smokes, was, uh, I believe, the proposal from uh, Azteca Underground. So Lena, on behalf of the uh, unnamed owner that uh, still hasn't been named on MLW yet, of Azteca Underground, uh, asking Savio Vega and I, the IWA to basically sell, or basically demanding that they sell the IWA to Azteca Underground. Yeah, and as we've seen uh, uh, in concern with the Caribbean belt recently, uh, Savio Vega, a very proud man, a very proud Puerto Rican, he doesn't want to sell IWA to an outside uh, and mysterious uh, uh, investor. So, yeah, he's he's denying this offer. Uh, Selena doesn't want him to deny it and tells him he has no choice in the matter but I think he probably must and he's not going to sell so we, we still have this kind of uh, clandestine uh, business uh, uh, angle going on here where uh, Selena's Promociones Dorado got sold and then uh, now, now we've got this mysterious uh, benefactor that wants to buy the uh, Puerto Rican uh, promotion from Savio Vega, all very interesting and, and all uh, leading up to Selena De Laurenta's obvious uh, uh, attempts to take over MLW in its entirety. And uh, I don't think she'll stop until she gets everything. Yeah, definitely. I, I got to ask this. Do you have any predictions at this point, Papa Smokes, who it is that owns Azteca Underground, who this mysterious investor could possibly be? Yeah, I, I was kind of thinking about it. I, I can't think if it would be anyone that we know already. It might be someone, that, a new uh, person that we don't know yet, but uh, I, I'm unsure as of yet. Do you have a guess? Well, you know what? I've had some thoughts on this, and I, I'm going to go out on a limb, and I'm going to make my prediction right now, and I, I can't think of the guy's name at the moment, and he might go under a different name if he does show up here. But if we recall not too long ago, there was a little show on television called Lucha Underground. And Lucha Underground had a guy that was on television there, and I can't think of his name right now, so I apologize for not having that. Anyone let me know in the comments what name I'm missing out on. But he was kind of the, the GM or the owner. He was the main guy that centered around everything. He was the, the Vince McMahon of the Lucha Underground and everything, and... You know, I, I just have a strong feeling like this is the guy who's going to be revealed as the possible Azteca underground boss when it comes down to it. 
Okay, that would make sense. The other possibility, I thought, if it's someone that we already know, it could be Selena's, you know, as we know him, an enemy and an old enemy, Conan, uh, with a, a turn, right? It could be Conan uh, making the turn towards a heel. That could happen too as well. And I mean, again, that would be big news for MLW. Uh, seeing Conan return to TV. Uh, a lot of a lot of ways this could go, but the nice thing is they're leaving it mysterious, Pop of Smokes. It keeps us guessing. I can only make predictions just like you can, and we could sit back and wait and wait till the big reveal that's going to come up eventually. Yeah, yeah. Uh, from there, I don't know if we if I missed anything else or we're straight to the Zen Chi versus Calvin Tankman match. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. So, yeah, so our boy Zen Chi, we've been praising him. Week after week, getting better and more exciting, this guy. And, man, he's going to step in there one more time with Kelvin Tankman. Heavyweight hustle. This was not looking too positive for Zenshi, but, damn it, if he didn't get in, a very quality match out of this one, Pop Smokes. Yeah, yeah. And uh, one of the things I liked about this match was that we've watched Zenshi before, raised his... Uh, his uh, acrobaticness and his, uh, his lightness of foot, his ability to, to use aerial maneuvers and spring off the ropes. If you watch the first couple minutes of this match, Zenji's in against the appropriately named Calvin Tankman, who was built like a tank. He's, uh, Zenji started off with his uh, typical kind of offense, uh, f- flying around the ring, trying some aerial moves, and this just wasn't working. We've also seen this match in a previous episode as well. Uh, when Tankman was first starting, he fought Zenshi. And that offense didn't go so well for Zenshi in that match either. But you notice in this one, after the first four minutes or so, Zenshi realizes that he's, there's too much of a weight difference in this match and his aerial maneuvers aren't working. So he actually, you can kind of almost see the, the line where he changes up his style a little bit because the previous one wasn't working. He goes to more strikes, more takedowns and uh, flying kicks and other things that just uh, where his his body weight in the aerial maneuvers just wasn't doing it. Tankman was catching him, blocking him, knocking him down. But we saw that line where Zenshi changed up the style to a more striking based style and then started to get a bit more uh, success out of this style. I, I thought that was really neat and, and very well set up in this match. Yeah, and you know what? This is what I'm really enjoying about Zenshi is he continues to surprise every time we watch him. Like, not only is he improving with the ring work, but then you get that, that comes down to the psychology of it and realizing, hey, this didn't work first time around. It's not working at the start of this one, it's time to switch this thing. And yeah, he switches it up. It, you know, comes across really, really well. Starts to give Calvin Tankman probably his most competitive match to date as a result. Tankman still, man, I mean, that size, that strength, and that ability he's got is one in the end. And damn it, man, that body check. Holy shit, does that thing send a guy flying? And when you got a guy the size of Zenshi, man, can he sell a bump like that one? Holy shit, that was great. That was totally beautiful, and uh, Zenshi got a couple of nice uh, Inziguri style kicks in at the end of that match that Tankman sold nicely to, and it just raised that doubt in the viewer's mind, and you think, well, I kind of thought Tankman was going to win this fairly easily, but it, it puts that doubt there when he gets a few good moves in, and it's like, well, now I'm not totally sure what's going to happen in this match, and Again, that's exactly what you want, to, that feeling in your viewer that you don't know who's going to win. You, you, it's up in the air still, and, and this match had me hooked. Yeah, me too. And you know what? More and more, becoming a big fan of Zenshi. Each time we talk about him, Bob Smokes, I, I look forward to the next time we get to watch Zenshi in a ring because he continues to surprise, continues to improve. And I find every single time we talk about one of his matches... We're talking more about him than the guy winning. I mean, we got Calvin Tankman, yeah. ha- heavyweight hustle here, is undefeated in MLW. The guy is bowling over everybody that's put in front of him. And yet, we're talking about Zenshi, the guy who hasn't even picked up a win since we started watching him in MLW. But y- you know it's coming. And when it does, man, we're going to be drinking beers that night and celebrating because it's going to be one hell of a time. Yeah, absolutely. It may take a while, but I think it's going to come. This kid's got all kinds of promise. You can tell he's young. He's very, very light, but 
look at they have that uh, MLW middleweight title. This is a guy that could get in there against Laredo Kid and Leo Rush and uh, Myron Reed and any of the other middleweights and uh, give a good competitive match. And hey, you never know what happens in any match. Uh, anybody has a chance to win just depends on uh, what happens. So uh, yeah, uh, again, we're talking about Zanchi all through this match and uh, he's getting himself over big time with us. Definitely. So, and hopefully with all the rest of the fans that watch, and you know what, if nobody's checked him out, go check out Zenshi. I'm pretty sure this is a guy that not only, you know, old school fans like ourselves can enjoy, but I believe the new school guys will actually really enjoy the work of Zenshi as well, too, and can appreciate someone who's got the right psychology for doing the, you know, the lightweight, high-flying, you know, this middleweight division that, you know, this middleweight division that's been kicking a lot of ass for MLW. Really loving it. Awesome match. Great for both parties. Well done. Yeah, couldn't agree more. But the next little segment we had was uh, Joseph Samael for Contra with uh, another lovely promo. This guy's such a great talker and, and uh, so convincing and so scary. But basically, he's promising the end of both Injustice and Hammerstone. And uh, like we said, Contra's got quite a few members, but they also have a couple of feuds on the go at the same time. And uh, we'll have to see what happens with this. But we've got more matches coming up that are going to uh, going to uh, lead into this whole feud, too. And doesn't Yosef Samael have just the sweetest gig on the planet right now? Like, he basically is cutting promos from wherever it is he's cutting promos. Then he's sending his boys out. He's telling them where they're going, what they're doing, and everything like that. They're listening like the like they should be to their leader and stuff like that. This guy's sitting back, calling the shots from basically a control room, more or less. Doesn't have to be down there at ringside. And the job's getting done. Yeah, yeah. And as a, another note uh, that you would appreciate, Munson, I think, if you ever uh, look into Joseph Samuel or maybe follow him on social media, the man has excellent taste in music and a massive record collection. And, uh, that was one of the things that drew me to him as well. Uh, very similar taste in music to myself. He, his is much wider than mine, but uh, I, th I think you would find it interesting. The, the man loves some uh, some good heavy music. Oh, perfect. I mean, I love a good variety of music. Definitely love some heavy music too, so that's something i got to check out. That's uh, one thing we'll have to talk about one time on the show as well too. We'll get into uh, musical tastes and musical pieces in wrestling or something like that we'll get to it but you know we get more to talk about from this mlw episode uh up next i believe was the interview between alicia toot and richard holiday uh recapping the strap match the caribbean strap match and the wrongdoings there and also maybe uh building a little bit of more of that uh tension that i'm pretty sure everybody's noticing between alicia toot and richard holiday <laughs> It's definitely noticeable, yeah. Every time they talk, they look like a couple that's having a little squabble of some kind. But at any rate, uh, Alicia in this segment was uh, calling out Holiday straight out for his use of Tim Donahue in that strap match. Uh, Tim Donahue, of course, being the disgraced former NBA ref that was caught uh, match-fixing in the playoffs in the NBA a few years ago. He definitely fixed that match uh, between uh, Holiday and Savio Vega, the strap match for the Caribbean title. And, uh, yeah, Alicia's not letting Richard off the hook about this one and uh, giving him the hard questions and uh, Holiday trying to uh, weasel his way out of it and uh, kind of ended up storming out of this segment. But uh, the tension continues and uh, also the controversy around his uh, use of referees and his, uh, his ignoring of the rule book sometimes. So one company gets Donahue, the other company gets Shaquille O'Neal, and yeah, I'm still more excited about the referee in this situation when you ask me. Personally, I think Donahue is a much more interesting person when it comes to professional wrestling than Shaquille O'Neal ever will be. <laughs> I might agree with you. I had to take the jab while we're at it. But anyway, moving on from there, I believe we're up to our next match. This episode packed full of matches, and it's Team Contra. Uh, Davari and Simon Gotch taking on Injustice, Justice, Myron Reed, and Jordan Oliver. And man, this one, <laughs> where do you start? Where do you start? Probably where you end. I mean, this one didn't even get going, Baba Smokes. Injustice making their way down a ring. They get a, get attacked, and all hell breaks out from there. Yeah, this feud has obviously heated up a lot over the last few weeks. It's uh, 
started with some challenges and uh, some verbal stuff, but uh, as we saw with Injustice uh, impersonating the Sentai Death Squad, they put one over on Contra and uh, laid a little beating on them with the flag poles a couple episodes ago, and uh, this feud still revolves around, I think, that... Uh, but the third member of Injustice, Cotto Brazil, was was badly injured by Contra uh, just in the time before the COVID shutdown, so a, a year ago, I guess. And uh, Brazil has had to retire, so uh, Injustice not happy about that. Uh, still looking for some revenge for their fallen comrade, and uh, they're going hard at Contra. And uh, I, I worry for the guys because uh, taking on Contra is 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 no small task, but. Uh, they're going for it, and they've had a little bit of success so far. But uh, in this match, uh, I was hoping to see, you know, some. Uh, uh, I was hoping to see who was going to be tougher in this, or which tag team was maybe going to get the win out of this, and maybe uh, take a little step towards winning this feud. But like you said, it, the match never got going. Uh, Injustice coming out to the ring were attacked from behind by the world champion Jacob Fatu. And then the beatdown commenced with uh, the rest of Contra playing the boots to Injustice. Uh, yeah, and Fatu, uh, uh, furious during this time. He, he doesn't like the disrespect of all these people trying to challenge him and wanting matches with him, so uh, he wasn't happy about this situation either. Yeah, definitely not. So, I mean, this fight breaks out. Uh, like I said, all hell breaking loose. Uh, the, you know, the Injustice said basically... Bit off a lot here, Bob, I suppose we mentioned it. We said there'd be hell to pay for their actions, and hell to pay. I mean, Contra come out, they're laying down the beat down, and yeah, it's just absolute chaos. Didn't get the match we were expecting. Uh, was looking forward to seeing how this could pan out, but again, you got to keep the feud going. There's a lot to happen here. We still know that Jordan Oliver's uh, trying to challenge Fatu for that world championship again I think the young guy's a little out of his league, but we'll see how that pans out when he gets that one-on-one -on -one opportunity, see how he does against a big boy like Fat too. But, man, uh, Injustice, I, a lot of balls. i got to give him that, a lot of balls. But uh, what, we'll see who comes out at the end of this uh, looking, be looking better, I guess. Yeah, it's still Injustice kind of got a small victory over Contra in this uh, beatdown because they managed to isolate Jacob Fatu in the ring, gave him a nice uh, double-team tag-team maneuver and put him on his back for a bit. And then Fatu, not used to that. Uh, again, they, they, they could, they've they got his attention, and uh, this must be considered a small victory, at least for Injustice. Yeah, and that double-team maneuver was fantastic, too. I think that would make for a great tag-team double, uh, you know, finishing maneuver for the two of them. Uh, that they could utilize and be a great tag team in the tag division moving forward with MLW. Uh, I think there's tons of potential with them as a tag team for sure. And uh, definitely future tag team champions, if you ask me. Yeah, I, I think they even have been tag champions before. They used to have the old kind of Freebird thing going when there was three of them. They, they would just pick two guys to be in the match, but they always had that spare guy at ringside, which... Of course, it's always handy when you're heel tag team champions. And, uh, yeah, I like Myron and, and Jordan as a team, and uh, I think they've got a lot of potential. Maybe they'll make a run for lost marks in the near future. Yeah, it'd be great to see. Uh, from there, we go on to the Filthy Island Control Center. So we got Filthy Island coming up next week on MLW. Uh, it's still going to be interesting to see, but now more being fleshed out. So we're finding out here we're going to get an appearance and a match from uh, Rocky Romero from New Japan Pro Wrestling, who we saw in the 2020 Opera Cup. Uh, they had mentioned that, yeah, now it's been uh, made official. There is going to be a match with Salvio Vega and Mil Nortes. Uh, I believe, was was there a, a stipulation added to that match I could I missed here, Pop Smokes? Yeah, it was uh, an Aztec jungle fight, I believe. That was it, yes, yeah. So that one booked there as well, too. And I believe also uh, mentioning about Kevin Koo, uh, Dominic Cabrini going to be uh, participating in matches as well, too. Uh, Filthy Island really fleshing out here, and uh, I think we're going to get quite the show. It's going to be interesting to see what uh, Tom Lawler's vision is once we get to this uh, Filthy Island here next week. Yeah, I think we've all been a little confused as to what the concept of Filthy Island was actually going to be until 
realized it was just uh, basically Lawler uh, taking a uh, one whole episode of MLW Fusion, and then you know, customizing it to his own uh, to his own needs, kind of thing. And yeah, he's making a, a, a fight card out of it, and it sounds like it's gonna be more uh, more catered towards a, a MMA or or a cage fighting kind of uh, look more than professional wrestling. This is a sense I get anyway, but. I, I'm still not sure what I'm going to see until I see it, I think. So I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, looking forward to being able to talk about that one with you once we get there. Uh, but, Tay, we got to come to an end of MLW 121 first, and we're going to do that right now. We're hitting up the main event. This one is AAA's Laredo Kid, the AAA Cruiserweight Champion, taking on MLW's Leo Rush, who is the MLW uh, middleweight champion, and I believe this one is listed as a title unification match, if I'm not mistaken, Papa Smokes. Yeah, both straps are up in this one. Yeah, so anyway, both straps up. Leo Rush, who had just re- recently made his debut and had picked up that uh, that championship from Myron Reed in what was a fantastic match. He's been cutting those great promos. We've seen the Laredo kid get in there, mix it up, do some great work as well, too. These two had a style... That's very suiting of of their you know capabilities, and man, they kicked off a good solid match. Uh, great work from both participants. Again, a lot of that stuff that Leo Rush does is actually quite exciting. Again, even you know using the bottom ropes a lot or the middle ropes that he bounces off of. I know we mentioned that previously in our review of his match with Myron Reed, and just more of it here, and it just works. I I'm really loving. This middleweight division in MLW, but really, really enjoying the work of Leo Rush more than I see him lately. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I, like I've said in previous episodes, when we uh, first discovered that Leo Rush was coming to MLW, I kind of heard, you know, he doesn't have the best reputation uh, in general in, in professional wrestling. And I'd heard of some things when he was on the indies a couple of years ago. I'd heard a few things about his uh, locker room demeanor when he was in NXT. And, uh, yeah, frankly, I, I was not expecting a whole lot from this guy. I kind of had the feeling, uh, this is, again, without knowing the guy's work, I kind of had the feeling that he was uh, one of those guys that just thinks he's thinks he is actually better than everyone else, uh, everyone else, thinks he doesn't have to work as hard as everybody else. So I was quite prepared to... to not like this guy genuinely and, and not be into his stuff, but I, I couldn't have been more surprised. Uh, I, I'm not even that much of a fan of the uh, aerial uh, and quick style like that, but uh, Leo Rush has mastered that. And yeah, like we've said about using the ring differently, and uh, he does a lot of moves that are down low to the mat, kind of more suiting of his physical stature. He doesn't try and leap up into the air where everybody else is. He stays down low, and I, I think it's so smart. It also looks very creative and refreshing that his his style doesn't look like everybody else's. And uh, in there with a, a similar uh, aerial master like uh, the Laredo Kid, and these two are both so fast and so agile. It was just really tremendous to watch uh, two guys just put their skills on display like this. And uh, and the uh, having both the belts on the line made it gave it a big fight feel, gave it a real title match feel. And uh, the Laredo Kid was uh, on the defensive for a whole bunch of this match, but then just when you thought maybe we might be heading towards a finish, he. Laredo Kid starts making a comeback, starts, uh, like it seems like he changed his thing up a little bit throughout the match too, and all of a sudden he started working over Leo Rush's legs, and he, it was, it was, it makes sense, it's like a wrestler saying, damn it, I, I, this guy's kind of getting the better of me, even in my own style, so I gotta do something different, I'm gonna ground this, I'm gonna slow it down, I'm gonna change this whole match around to the way I want it. And I'm going to start working over his legs and, and take away some of that uh, propulsion and momentum that uh, Leo Rush uses in all his moves. And again, like we talked about before, this this kind of match psychology just works for me. It makes a lot of sense. It makes logical sense that a, a wrestler would try a strategy like that in order to get the win. And uh, yeah, this match, just uh, two thumbs up for me. Uh, I really, really liked it. 
Yeah, and again, that ending too, uh, Leo Rush coming off of the bottom rope with that springboard stunner and then climbing up for that uh, frog, frog splash at the end to pick up the wind. I thought it was a fantastic finish. Great work by both guys. Leo Rush unifies the championships. And man, what, what a way to kick off this division here in 2021. I think a lot of eyes in the wrestling world should be open to MLW's uh, entire show but if nothing else if the modern fans don't always enjoy everything over there if nothing else they should be checking out these matches in the middleweight division because it very much is suited to a lot of the style that I think the modern day wrestling fans tend to really enjoy and I think they could get a lot of love out of that particular division especially with the great workers that MLW have working there yeah agreed and, and with that final uh vision that we had or the final scene that we had of, of Rush celebrating in the ring with those two beautiful belts and everything. Now it just, it really begs the question as to how many uh, middleweight or uh, yeah, middleweight wrestlers from uh, AAA Lucha Libra will be coming up to MLW to challenge for that belt. I mean, we must assume that there will be some, if, if the champ is now in MLW, then, We'll be getting some guest shots from uh, AAA, I assume, anyway, and I, this excites me a lot, too, because I kind of have a fascination for Lucha. I think they have a great thing going on down there in AAA, and I, I'd just like to see more of their talent, uh, especially if they can get a chance to get over in the big American audiences. Yeah, I think it's great exposure for AAA and a lot of their talent. I'm looking forward to being able to see them more on a regular basis. Uh, it's exciting times, Papa Smokes, and I'm glad we're able to cover this and uh, look into these things every single week. Uh, the, again, this match, just like you gave it two big thumbs up, it gets two big thumbs up from me. Uh, Leo Rush, great work. Laredo Kid, great work. MLW, thank you again for another great wrestling show. And I stress wrestling show because it's 90% wrestling and maybe about 10% entertainment. But the entertainment they do have makes sense and it's enjoyable. So if you haven't already... Go check out MLW Fusion over on YouTube. Papa Smokes and I give them our big thumbs up. But from there, Papa Smokes, we got stuff to continue on the show with, and that's going to be our big interview with Spencer Love. So without further ado, Papa Smokes, I'm going to get Spencer Love on the line here, and we're going to kick off this interview. There we go. I think we're recording. Perfect. All right. So, hey, everybody, and we're welcomed by our special guest, Spencer Love, here on Ring Respect Radio. And look at this. Figured out technology. Well, I'm on the Zoom here today. How are you doing, Spencer? I'm good. Like I said, it's uh, it's nice that the snafu fixed itself. I've had far too many concerns or far too many issues with Zoom through uh, this entire situation. You know, this COVID thing that you may not have may or may not have heard of at this point. It's a very a little bit. known thing going on. Um, so I'm glad that it wasn't an issue that you and I had to reschedule, and you and Papa Smokes and I had to reschedule on because man. I'm excited to be here. I love listening to you guys. I'm so excited to like actually chat with you guys face to face or phone to phone because after listening for so long, it's one of those things I feel like you get to know people, but you never really know people yeah. until you sit down. So it's great to chat, guys. Thanks for having me on today. Oh, well, thanks for being on. This is a great honor. Uh, we haven't done a whole lot of having people on our show before and stuff like <laughs> that. So this is new to us. We're loving it. And uh, yeah, we got Papa Smokes on the phone for everybody uh, tuning in, watching this right now. So you uh, don't get to see his lovely face, but you get to hear his voice in the background. <laughs> that So just thanks for joining the conversation, Papa Smokes. Yeah, I'm even further behind in technology than you guys are, so uh, you don't get the face this time. <laughs> <laughs> well, don't worry. I've uh, I've been told often I have a face for radio, so I think in some cases this uh, this may not be to the benefit of the viewers that my face is on it as nicely as I can put it towards myself. <laughs> Uh, so this is going to be a lot of fun. So, uh, yeah. So anyway, Love Wrestling, Spencer. The Love Wrestling is your show on YouTube. Anybody should go over, check it out, subscribe, definitely, and give you some love over there. Uh, tell us a little bit first before we get into Love Wrestling, though. How did your journey in professional wrestling start? I want to know how you got involved with professional wrestling and to the point where we're at today. 
Yeah, like it's uh, it's a long winded story, admittedly. So it depends on if you want to cut me off at any point or not. But feel free to if you feel the need. Um, I kind of have like a, a sort of non traditional journey as far as professional wrestling goes. I suppose uh, most people I talk to, or most people, whether they're inside the industry or they're just professional wrestling fans. A lot seem to have the typical story of, yeah, I was a fan for my entire life. The first memory I have is Monday Night Raw or whatever there. And um, for me, I wasn't really like a wrestling fan growing up by any means. It just never seemed to be the show that was on television. My mom and dad never grew up fans. And uh, I never really found it sort of popping up on TV in any circumstances when I was a kid. Outside of the fact that for Tuesdays and Thursdays, I would go to my grandma and grandpa's for lunch. And they would just be playing the highlights on Sportsnet here in Edmonton. So I wouldn't get the full Monday Night Raw. I wouldn't get all the SmackDown, but I'd get the highlights. The first memory that I've got in pro wrestling is the big show and Brock Lesnar breaking the ring. But quite literally, guys, like I, I wasn't a huge pro wrestling fan um, up until I turned 18, 19. And I remember that the first independent professional wrestling show that I went out to was the PWA 11th anniversary show here in Edmonton. They were still running out of the Century Casino at the time. And like, I feel like you can make a lot of the same comparisons to the independent scene now in Canada and that you go through the card and it was quite literally like a who's who of professional wrestling, whether you're talking independence or whether you're talking like the major leagues to use my air quotes, like Taya Valkyrie's on the card, Peyton Royce is on the card, Casey Spinelli's on the card, Michael Richard Blaze, Brandon Van Danielson, Ravenous Randy Myers, like again, just it, there's no better way to put it than a who's who. So that was really my first introduction to pro wrestling. I didn't even really start to get into like, um, again, using the air quotes, like the major leagues up until the first pay-per-view I remember watching was Clash of Champions, I believe it was, or Night of Champions. I can't remember when they made the switch. Um, when Seth Rollins was wrestling Brock Lesnar, The Undertaker came back and interrupted the match heading into their SummerSlam match. Again, like, I'm sure you can relate to a ton like professional wrestling fans tend to do. My years are a bit fuzzy, but I can very clearly remember the moment. And from there, like, honestly, that was sort of when I had the come to Jesus moment of, okay, this is the SHIT I love. I have to watch Raw. I have to watch SmackDown. Never heard of NXT or Impact or whatever it may be at this point, but I'm watching all of it. Like I dove in with both feet right into the deep end. And uh, at least as far as a fan goes, I, I, I just love pro wrestling. I can't find a better way. And I've got to find a less cliche way to put it as a guy who's got a last name of love and runs love wrestling. I feel like people are, if you were to do a drinking game of how many times I say the word love in a podcast, I am certain we would run into some legal issues. So do not do that. But uh I just quite literally as a pro wrestling fan, there there is very little that that I don't love. Of course, there are storylines. There are um, for sure various instances and circumstances that cannot be talked about positively. But um, for me, whether you're looking at character work, music, storylines, whatever it may be, again, um, I just love to show my love of professional wrestling, whether it be as a fan or luckily enough over the last few years as a uh, podcaster and personality i suppose you would say definitely yeah so uh you know talking about the drinking game i know you got papa smoke's attention there. i think that might be a good idea coming up I, uh, one night drinking to uh the mention of love on the show and i'm certain i would play i just figured for legal reasons it's your podcast so i may as well cover the uh the legal caveats before we get into that end of things well, well, i've broken all legal things on this show <laughs> yeah, it's all good. Uh, but how about your involvement in in the, in the independent scene in Alberta and stuff like that? Uh, you mentioned going to the shows, but I think you've had uh, some involvement in the background. Uh, where did that come about? How did you get involved there? Um, so Force Pro Wrestling is is really the only promotion I've done any official work for. Um, and, and I can't thank Ivan slash Tex Gaines enough for that. Getting involved on that side of things, whether it be the stuff I did with Backstage or uh, I was lucky enough to hop on commentary for their final show up to this point, um, but not final show. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Um, it's just such a cool experience. And it was never something, again, when I got into podcasting or writing or uh, sort of took baby steps into the content creation side of things, I guess. 
it was never something that um, I ever thought I wanted to do or ever even thought was a possibility. You know, I got into pro wrestling and my coverage in a very um, unofficial sense of things. I know that there are still people out there who, um, you know, rightfully or not think I'm shitty at what I do because I'm unofficial in what I do, but opinions are opinions. Um, I've never outside of force pro done anything like official and, Quite frankly, it, it's been kind of nice to have, um, you know, not a perfect mix. There's no such thing as perfection, but I think a very good mix of both um, official and unofficial experience, if you know what I mean. Yeah. It's really nice for me to be able to do the stuff with Force Pro Wrestling, and I absolutely love the ability to uh, get in on the commentary and stuff I never again would have thought I'd have the chance to do. But um, getting to still have sort of the... the um, fan experience is still so fun for me. It's still so cool to get to see announcements from uh, any of the various promotions out here in Alberta, like real Canadian wrestling announcing Josh Alexander. Uh, I would just have to assume here, but I feel like if, if at the professional level, Dave Meltzer has to at least have an idea of what's going on or Sean Ross Sapp has to have an idea of what's going on. And in some way, I feel like that takes away from the fan experience. Whereas for me, I have no idea that RCW is announcing that Josh Alexander is coming back, especially when he's wrestling heavy metal again. I have no idea. So when I'm scrolling through Facebook again, I've got the proverbial mark out moment, right? So um, it's been very cool to have the opportunity to do some uh, official stuff. It really has been because um, I like to think I, I, I like to think I can talk and I also like to think I can ramble to both the, uh, detriment and benefit of what I do but it was kind of cool to have that I guess put to the test in a number of ways that um are really out of my wheelhouse and I say that in the most positive ways I loved doing them but backstage interviews and playing a character is so different than doing an interview I know that's something you guys can relate to so um getting to do it cool as hell and I can't wait to do the opportunity again yeah there's a lot of a lot of things involved and stuff like that and uh love love your involvement so far too and there's uh thank uh, you hopefully a lot of great things coming up uh before we go any further pop smokes anything that uh, you want to ask right now oh. there is a, i was interested spencer when you were talking about uh, when you first got into wrestling you weren't watching a lot on tv but the love really came up when you started going to live shows and in a year where we haven't had live shows for the past uh past number of months or past year how important are, are the live shows to you as a wrestling fan and and to the uh the betterment of pro wrestling as a whole man i number one i think that no matter which way you cut it um the live experience is so important. And I, I do want to stress that like WWE and impact and all of the promotions really that have been running with no fans. Um, I think all of them have done a great job. You know, some have done better jobs than others, whether it be on the testing side, whether it be on the story side. And I know that there's a wide variety of opinions there that I'm not going to touch, but as far as it goes for what you can do, given the circumstances, like even when it came to WrestleMania 36 last year, even when it came to the performance center shows that I know were really rough and grimy and greasy and were definitely um, in the nicest way possible to them, like a very first attempt at running wrestling with no fans. Um, I, I think that every, every promotion should be commended for the work they've been able to do. But I think like a lot of wrestlers, a lot of promoters, anyone involved in professional wrestling would say, that live experience is so important. And I think for me, especially when you get to the independent level, um, luckily enough, you know, WWE and all elite and, and again, the major leagues, I always use my air quotes because when you say major leagues, it almost sounds like it's, it's taking away from the work people do at independent. So I always want to make sure the work is recognized as equally as possible. Everybody's taking a beating for us. Um, but when you look at the independent level, these are individuals who, whether they're individuals who are in it because they love wrestling, not expecting um, a hot dog and a handshake. I hate the cliche, but people who are quite literally just coming out because they love to wrestle. Or if you're somebody who, whether you're paying a phone bill, an electric bill, 
all of your bills, whatever it may be through independent wrestling. Those are the people I really feel for because fans coming in, paying their tickets, the actual live event is what sort of butters their bread, right? So um, even outside of my experience as a fan, I am aching to get out to shows. I was lucky enough to get to a couple that RCW did out here in Edmonton. Uh, when they were running, I unfortunately couldn't get out to CWE because my shows, or excuse me, shows, my uh, my shoot job was running at the same time. Monster Pro did some great shows in the interim, and I was lucky enough to get to their outdoor stuff. Like, I'm aching not more than anybody, but certainly as much as anybody to get back out to live shows. I think quite literally they are as, as fundamental as it gets at the independent level. I think once you get involved with... Um, TV contracts or streaming deals or stuff like that. Not to say that not having a live crowd isn't a detriment, but I also do think that at the very least, a lot of those people provided they're willing to and provided they're able to travel have been able to do, you know, what they loved and what pays their bills throughout this pandemic in some way, shape and form. So um, I, I think, I think it's brutal either way. You know, I, I can't cut it either way. I'm trying to make a lot of justifications, hence my stuttering. But um, at the very least, there are a lot of people who have been able to continue doing this despite no fans. As far as it goes for presentation, though, that's an entirely different story. Fans are fundamental. Yeah. 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 Go ahead. Oh, no, I was going to say I couldn't agree more. I mean, we know we've been itching for a return to live action. Uh, Saskatchewan's been grounded ever since the mm-hmm. start of this whole thing. Uh, we just had got rolling with PPW and basically put to a halt. And, I mean, Bob Smokes and I trying to do this uh, remote uh, podcast and everything like that and making the most of a bad situation, praying that something good's going to come out of this year and we can get back to the live action. And you know what? If Alberta gets there first, uh, Papa Smokes and I, I think we might have to make a road trip out to Alberta. <laughs> well, I've got a double bed pullout couch. So as long as it's only the two of you guys coming up, we've got room. If there are any more, we've got room, but somebody's fighting for that couch. <laughs> <laughs> I don't feel like fighting, so... <laughs> 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 but I agree, like, and especially in Saskatchewan's case, like you guys said, like, Alberta's been very lucky that whether you agree with how the restrictions have gone or not, um, we were lucky enough that we were able to get a few shows for a few months of the year. And especially on RCW's end, you know, um, full credit to them, I think that being able to provide the opportunity for wrestlers, not only to wrestle, but wrestle back to back on weekly shows is absolutely huge. You know, I think that the proverbial and I've never wrestled. So a lot of the cliches I'm about to spout off, I just, and, and am not just, but am uh, just a mark, but like, you know, getting your reps in and putting in that sort of work and getting the experience in front of a live crowd, especially when, you know, I'm sure you can speak to it in Saskatchewan as well. When you've got a fan base that, that, just gives a shit when you really give a shit about the professional wrestling and the people behind it. um, That's the best experience you can get, you know, unfortunately in, in not Alberta, but I've had the chance to go out to indie shows in the States and stuff like that. And, and maybe they're not in as front of, maybe they're not in as much of a passionate fan base. And uh, it's just tough, you know, how, how you can feel invested in what you're doing at that point. And it's no discredit to the promoters or the wrestlers, but if you're wrestling in front of few people, it's hard to get motivated when you're wrestling in Alberta and Saskatchewan and BC and a a large part of Canada, from my experience, you're wrestling in front of people who care and you're going to wrestle in front of a pretty full house a lot of the time. And getting the experience to do that as often as you get with real Canadian wrestling, I think is absolutely fantastic. And uh, when you look at Saskatchewan, It's just unfortunate that a lot of those professional wrestlers out there didn't get the opportunity to wrestle as much, man. Like Michael Allen, Richard Clark, by my money, like he should be one of those guys in the conversation, not just uh, as far as top independent professional wrestlers. But when you're reading like those sports key to dream lists of top 10 wrestlers that WWE or AEW or dream promotion of choice, I guess, is talking about should sign. Uh he by my money is one of the best wrestlers out there sean moore davy o'doyle same sort of thing right like um it's unfortunate that those guys haven't had the chances that a lot of people in not only alberta but the states have had because um a lot of promotions and a lot of wrestlers have taken the opportunity not that they haven't um but to step up their streaming and when you're streaming great professional wrestling live when people are aching for it um no fault of anybody's but that's just it's unfortunate that a lot of Canada hasn't had the chance to do that. 
Yeah, very, very grounded so far, and it's been unfortunate for many of the wrestlers. Uh, anything to add, Papa Smokes? Yeah, I was just going to also add that the fans out here in Saskatchewan are, are just dying of thirst, too, because uh, we, we only have the one company in this whole province now, which is DPW in Saskatoon, and uh, we have fans that drive hours to come and see the, our, our monthly shows and everything, and it just speaks to the passion you were talking about, Spencer. And they really, really love the product. They really love wrestling, and including the, the live shows, which, which is a different experience than watching on TV and a much uh, more intense experience. So, yeah, we can definitely speak to that, too. Our, our wrestlers are, are suffering and our fans are suffering terribly, and we're just, we're just hoping we can run in some form this summer, maybe in the outdoor or the uh, public uh, or the spaced-out uh, uh, venue of some kind, and uh, just we want to give our fans what they're dying for. Yeah, it's going to yeah. be great when we can get to that point. Uh, we're looking forward to it. I know you are too. But in the meantime, you know, the three of us have been able to make the most of a bad situation with our podcasts, our uh, videos that we've been creating and stuff like that. And speaking of which, new show, Love Wrestling. And I love it. I've uh, watched quite a few of these interviews. You've done a great job and uh, really enjoyed watching a couple in particular, like uh, Mike Bennett was a great one. I know Papa Smokes and I talked about his match with Nick Aldis. Uh, that he recently had oh, with the man. NWA, fantastic matchup. Yeah, it <laughs> so was so good. Yeah, so and, good, and uh, and I really appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, and then uh, you also had Chelsea Green on the show. I know you've known her for quite a while, long time. That was a you know big one to really get, considering her current position and stuff like that. Working with the WWE, um, mm -hmm. how did Love Wrestling come about? What uh, gave you the idea, and uh, what motivated you to go about this path? You know. Um, I know you guys are both a little bit familiar with the WCSN and what I was doing there, but for anybody who wasn't, I'll give as brief as I can without boring you guys. Um, the WCSN was a site that I had previously run with a few people out here in Alberta that um, strictly focused on Western Canadian professional wrestling, which for me personally, I think that uh, the work that I do with Love Wrestling, at least on my personal end, um, I still try and highlight as much as possible. You know, I still think that, I, I said it enough when we previously were talking about your last question there, but um, there's just so much talent out here and so much great talent. You know, I'm not just blowing smoke when I say that. Uh, and I'm not just making a pun on Papa Smoke's name by saying that, <laughs> but I think that there's just so much great talent out here. And, and, you know, I do think uh, I'll give the asterisk here that there could be a lot more done both promotion wise and professional wrestler wise to promote themselves. But I also think that there has been a lot of that done and a lot of that work put in and um, the juice to this point hasn't quite gotten what the squeeze has put in. You know what I mean? Um, you look at an MRB, you look at a Sean Moore, a guy I talked about earlier, Artemis Spencer, and these are guys who I think are definitely recognized, but like, man, it might just be my personal opinion and I might be punching above my weight class here. But again, um, when you're talking about guys like that, Michael Allen, Richard Clark, like, um, they're some of the best pro wrestlers in the world at this level, right? And some of the best pro wrestlers, even when you're comparing again to some of those proverbial major leagues. And um, I, I do think that there is a lot more room for promoting individuals like that, not just because they're great professional wrestlers, but because they're great people, at least in my experience. So that was where really the WCSN sort of, um, planted its flag, I guess, and really tried to promote the Western Canadian scene. We really tried to take like a, um, I mean this in the best way, not as a slag, but like sort of a dirt sheet approach to um, covering pro wrestling. I use the asterisks there because we never like would try and break anything before a promotion broke it or anything like that. We just simply wanted to report on literally everything going on in Western Canada. And that's where... Um, in the best possible way, sort of the downfall started is when uh, myself and Mike Maloney, who I know you guys know really well, and Kyle and a very, very talented, but a very limited group of people are trying to put out content on everything in Western Canada. Like Mike's putting out videos four or five or six times a day. I'm writing 10 to 12 articles a day. Kyle's like sending me podcasts months in advance because he's stressed because he's trying to do so many. And, and those are all again said in very positive ways, but uh, when they're not paying the bills, 
it's a lot of hard work. Again, I'll, I'll use the juice for no squeeze metaphor, right? Like um, it just became taxing. And I know I only speak for myself on this, but when it's starting to cut into work and time with my family and time with my brand new puppy and all of that sort of stuff, it's just time to take a step back, right? Like, so um, admittedly, I made a very quick decision. I sort of sat at my computer one day and I said, this is, uh, this is it. And backed out of that because I just, it was time, you know, um, the more I look back on it, it was just, I was burnt out. I was doing too much. I know a lot of other people were doing too much and, uh, it was time to take a step back and reevaluate. So shut down the site, sort of took a couple of days and started to really focus on, okay, what do I love about professional wrestling? And quite literally there is again, sort of the cliche, but the snap point for it is, well, shit, like I don't want to write 15 articles about not stuff that I don't love, but stuff that again is, is maybe not getting the views I want, or maybe I'm waking up at four 30 in the morning to write about these guys or whatever it may be. I'm going to wake up at nine. I'm going to have my coffee on a weekend and I'm going to write about Drew McIntyre claymoring the shit out of people every week. Right. Let's cover what I love about professional wrestling and hopefully provide a platform for other people to cover what they love in professional wrestling. Um, started to approach a number of people like Zach Ralph and Josh Robinson and the gentleman from Turnbuckle Rewind and uh, everybody, everybody else. I say this on every podcast. I feel like if I start listing names, I have to name everybody. So trust me, I will on this podcast at some point. <laughs> but I just started approaching people that um, truly were people I, I just wanted to work with, for lack of a better way to put it. It wasn't let's poach people. It wasn't let's build the you know, super friends of professional wrestling. Luckily enough, that's just what it's turned out to be, whether it's, um, you know, approaching Zach quite literally saying, Hey, I just want to work with you and have no idea how to and building out Thursday night quiz plex and testing people's trivia on pro wrestling or approaching Josh, because I think he might be one of the best content creators out there in pro wrestling um, and just content notwithstanding, but just approaching it again, saying, let's, let's work on what you love in professional wrestling. And I want to provide you a platform to do it. Um, had a lot of those conversations. And on January 1st, we, uh, we launched. And let me tell you guys, like, it's, it's, it's one of those things. I feel like the comparison I always make is that, um, you know, with a lot of matches, when I was recapping, I used to just like type out essays and essays about these matches when I started to realize a couple of months ago that the best thing I can say about a pro wrestling match is uh, just watch this match. There's no need for me to describe it. Just watch this match. And I feel like with everybody on the site and all of the content they put out, um, I am so, so um, blessed. I know it's such a cliche, blessed, lucky, my heart is warm, whatever else you want to throw on there. Um, that I get to work with people who I just look at their content every time I get it in my inbox or every time I put it out and say, shit, I could either just post an essay about this or I could say, check this out because I think it's cool as shit. I'm so lucky to work with the people I do. I'm so lucky that they were all so willing and so excited to jump on on quite literally for most of them, a random Edmontonian hopping in their Twitter DM saying, Hey, I think you're great. Do you want to do some cool shit? Because I am certain there are a lot of pro wrestlers and pro wrestling fans out there who have received thousands of those DMs. And the follow-up to it is, yeah, will you send me feet pics? And I'm just glad that all of them were like, you know what? This guy doesn't seem that weird. I'll at least respond. And we've gone from there. <laughs> what a great sir. And you know, you, you mentioned about, uh, you know, this super group of wrestling people in the area and stuff you know in a sense we know where you're coming from um I, when i got my kind of start into things the one thing i did notice was companies don't want to play kind with other companies there was a lot of animosity even between companies within our own province and then uh, crossing over to alberta you know don't mention these guys that's the competition and i think it's such an old way of thinking in a sense and we like old ways of thinking sometimes papa smokes and i but not in this sense i think that there needs to be this, you know, 
partnership in in a way, you know, being able to trade talent between companies and being able to do these interviews like we're doing here and just share the love of professional wrestling, not only in Canada, but Western Canada here and really be able to, you know, reach out and more so, I think, get over the wrestlers that are out here that deserve it kind of thing, because everybody in Western Canada is great. They get the psychology. They know how to get in there and give a good show each and every week. And I, I absolutely love doing this and I I've loved watching what you've done. And uh, yeah, Thank I you. guess uh, I got let Papa smokes cut in here at Papa smokes. Anything dad. And I think we just lost Pop Smokes on the call, so I'm going to bring him back in here quickly. <laughs> That's technical. No worries, because, like, you you make a great point there in that, like, um, you know, I know that as someone who's never worked in the business, brother, brother, that uh, it might not be my place, but I do think that there is a lot more room for uh, collaboration, not isolation. You know what I mean? I think that you've seen what people in Ontario can do with stuff like Backyard Pro and Go Hard Pro Wrestling and um, even in Edmonton, the clandestine society and what Michael Richard blaze and everybody who got involved in that show was able to do, um, even just on the online, you know, we talk about, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, we talk about the need for more online stuff and the need for even people like us to adapt to the changing world of professional wrestling in the, in the context of a pandemic. But when you look at what people are doing online and you look at stuff like Joey Janela's cluster F word, because I don't know for sure if I can curse yet. No, um, yeah, it's good. <laughs> perfect. The cluster fuck. Um, when you look at stuff like that and you look at what the collective's doing and IWTV and um, all of those sorts of individuals, it's so odd for me that um, it's not a market that's truly been exploited in, in, I'd say Canada as, Canada as a whole up until, you know, really go hard and, and Backyard Pro showed what you can do strictly online. And Clandestine did the same thing last year. We were just lucky enough to have fans in there in a, in a limited amount. So I can't give that strictly fat, fan attendance only or non-fan attendance only, excuse me, uh, to Clandestine. But you just see what people in Western Canada can do, what in what Canadians can do and, and – um, the attention people can draw internationally. I think one of the funniest analogies I've got for it, but one of the best analogies I can make for it, it was so funny for me at the end of clandestine society for uh, people to say that the stream was being torrented because it was popular enough and cool enough that people wanted to check it out. Um, and it's greasy. Don't get me wrong that you won't pay five 99 to backbreaker media to watch some great shit. But um the fact that people took the time out of their day to figure out, and it maybe it's just more impressive because I'm horrible with technology, but you took the time to figure out a way to stream this for free because you were that interested in Western Canada's premier professional wrestlers. I, I think it goes to show that there is the interest there. There is the desire for um, not just Albertans, not just Saskatchewanites, not just British Columbians, not just Canadians, but wrestling fans internationally and across the planet for lack of a better way to put it um to check out what we've got to offer and let me tell you guys i think that as far as what we've got to offer i would put our buffet up against pretty well any uh proverbial territory out there amen to that for sure uh papa smokes you're back on the line now uh any questions you want to run by spencer yeah yeah well sure i Spencer, I follow you on social media, and I've taken uh, interest in your bucket list of interviews. And I wanted to ask you how that's going. I, I've seen it's a list of 25 or 30 names that you uh, desire to interview, and uh, you've got quite a few of them crossed off and only a few left. Uh, how's the bucket list going? It's, um, and... and this is one of those sort of things where like the, the actual literal phrase unbelievable is all I can say about it is, is it's, it's, it's humbling. It really is humbling that a lot of the people who um, I quite literally considered pipe dreams when I got into this um, have taken their time for me and not only taken their time for me, but um, in the cases of people like MRB and a Chelsea green and a TJ Wilson and, um, great people like that. They've taken the time to, after I've interviewed them, it's, it's, it's the most crude way I can put it, but I unfortunately can't think of a better. It's not just like the, the F and Chuck, you know what I mean? It's not just let's do an interview and okay, it's the interview done. Like all of those people have been so giving with their time, their advice, their, um, 
just their energy. I don't, again, have a better way to put it. Those people have been so, so good to me. Um, I wrote my first bucket list. The first interview I ever released was March 3rd, 2018. And that was the third episode of Over the Top Rope that I ever did. Uh, that was a podcast that my brother Hayden Love and I started in, uh, yeah, January 2018. I think a Royal Rumble preview was our first episode or something about Brock Lesnar because he's rad. Um, but the third episode we ever did was quite literally, I sent emails off to everybody on that bucket list that I could find contact info for. And God bless them or whatever deity you believe in, bless them. MRB took the time to reply to me. He literally let me call him on his lunch break at work. And that was the first interview I ever did. That was March 3rd, 2018. The bucket list was written a few weeks before that. The first bucket list, I should say. Uh, and if I remember correctly, because I don't have it in front of me, I think I've got four names or five names left off of that original list that I've got to cross off off of about, I think 15 was each list because it looked nicely formatted when I printed the list and all that sort of stuff. So I think I got 15 names on every list. Luckily enough, I crossed off a good chunk of them off that first one. So yeah, about a month ago, I finally figured it was about time that... Uh, Let's revise it a bit. So the second list, I have just started to cross off. Um, unfortunately, I should say haven't crossed off anybody on the second list yet. But uh, don't worry, I'll tag them all in the Twitter comments when this episode comes out. Because I, you know, and, and I say this in, in hopefully the least annoying way possible, but um, I've always figured if a professional wrestler takes the time and tells me I do not want to do an interview, I'm unavailable, whatever it may be, man, I'm happy to respect that. Nobody, nobody at the independent level or at the big leagues owes me any of their time. But if your email address isn't giving me any kickbacks, I'm just going to justify in my mind that you haven't replied. So I have sent off emails to everybody on that second bucket list. So hopefully the next time I'm back, uh, We've got some good updates on that end. <laughs> Sounds good. All right. Any any other questions there, Bob Swokes? Uh, not for a moment. Go for it, Bob. Okay. Uh, what's been your favorite uh, interview that you've done so far on Love Wrestling in particular? I'm glad you narrowed it down. I'm really glad you narrowed it down. But at the same time, I think that uh, my response is pretty similar in that um, they're all favorites for very different reasons. I think that Deanna Perrazzo is a personal favorite of mine because she was someone, again, that I, I never thought I'd have the opportunity to chat with. And people went to bat for me to make that happen. She's someone who is one of the top pro wrestlers in the world, not just female pro wrestlers, but one of the top pro wrestlers in the world by my money. Again, I say this as, as positively towards myself as possible, but shit, they don't owe me any time. They don't owe me anything. So the fact that um, people went out of their way to vouch for me on that. And Deanna took the time for me is, is nuts. Um, both Mike Bennett and gentleman Jervis, I think were very great conversations for very similar reasons. And that, um, and I think I can make this comment about a lot of my interviews that I've done, but, um, my priority or, or sort of my modus operandi with a lot of these hasn't just been, um, you know, let's do a Q and a, let's find out, you know, the hot scoops for lack of a better way to put it. Let's find out about the people behind the pro wrestlers and getting the opportunity to chat to Bennett and, and gentleman Jervis, who two guys who, um, you know, great pro wrestlers. I don't think I need to say any more than they're great pro wrestlers, but um, on the mental health end, I think that both myself and a lot of other individuals can look up to as inspirations and influences. They were great conversations as far as that goes. Chelsea Green is is one of the best people I've ever had the opportunity to meet pro wrestling or otherwise. I just like shooting the shit with her. So, of course, I'm going to put her over every chance I get. And like Casey Cattell, like when I sent out the interview email to her, I had only like ever watched her wrestle throughout the pandemic, never live, never anything like that. But as again, I'm sure you guys can speak to uh, when you've got a lot of time on your hands, you watch a lot of pro wrestling and you get into that YouTube spiral and to send her an email and just be like, hey, I know so little about you outside of what I found out over the last few months. Let's shoot the shit and to have such a cool conversation. And again, to have someone that I now am, am lucky to consider a friend uh, is just cool. So I, I, I don't want to exclude anyone, but those are at the very least a few that come to mind off the bat. Um, 
But again, just, just to stress it, and I know it's cliche, I know anybody that anybody ever talks to never wants to leave anyone out, but um, I'm incredibly lucky to have had the luck and uh, the privilege that I have had with a lot of my guests. And uh, follow-up question to that, one person, all of professional wrestling right now, you get that interview, no questions asked, who is it going to be? Who's the dream interview for Love Wrestling? Bret Hart. Bret Hart. And, and, Great answer. <laughs> well, and, and, and he's a Canadian icon. He's my personal greatest of all time. He's the Mount Rushmore. He's, um, I said it before, but I'll say it again, a Canadian icon. There's no other way I can put it. Um, there are a lot of people I consider bucket list dream interviews, but um, I, I, I honestly think at this point, he would be the only guy that if I interviewed him and was hit by the proverbial bus the next day, okay, I've at least accomplished, and I use my air quotes for any of the audio listeners, I've at least accomplished everything I need to in pro wrestling because, damn it, I got to chat with Bret Hart. That's the hope. That's the dream. Uh, lots of people, if you're going to give me an extended list, though. <laughs> oh, I mean, Bret Hart, what a great selection. I mean, I grew up watching Bret Hart. Uh, that was kind of the era I came from was that late 80s, early 90s. So I saw his rise, saw him win the championship the first time in Saskatoon. So, I mean, if you get that interview, I mean, applaud you now. I mean, you've had some great ones, but that would be ultimate for sure. Uh, Thank you. That, Bob, and, <laughs> Send any tweets out you can on that end, man, because any way I can try and make that happen without annoying him. And I do stress that the guy's an icon. And if I bug him, shot is shot. You know what I mean? But let's do what we can. (laughs) No, but uh, if you can ever get that interview and if we can help you get that interview, I mean, by all means, we're going to keep sharing that name out there all we can. Uh, Anything else uh, to add on your end, Bob Smokes? No, I'm good. This has been a very interesting conversation. I'm glad to get the chance to meet you. Uh, well, maybe I'll use my air quotations here. I'll meet you and, and have a conversation with you in this way. And, uh, I love the fact that uh, our promotions and our uh, love of wrestling is bringing us together from between the two provinces. And uh, it's been a thrill to have you on Ring Respect Radio. Thanks a lot for being on. Man, thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you very you. much. We we appreciate everything. Uh, we want everyone to re- be reminded, go check out Love Wrestling on YouTube. Subscribe to the channel. Give thumbs up to Spencer. Show him some love because we got to get the word love in there a few more times for this drinking game to be possible next time. <laughs> and definitely, we got to do this again. This should be a more often thing. I uh, Get you on the show and uh, just be able to shoot the shit about pro wrestling. This has been a great time. Thank you very much for joining us on Ring Respect and uh, looking forward to having you again. Guys, thank you. I can't say it enough. I appreciate what you guys are doing. I appreciate what everybody at Backbreaker is doing. You guys are all doing great work for professional wrestling, so the thanks is quite genuinely all mine. Perfect. Thank you very much, Spencer. Have a great night. You too, friend. Bye-bye.